Amen. Well, if you turn your Bibles to the book of Genesis, chapter 27, we're going to be reading 41 verses. I only put sort of the lion's share in your bulletin because I couldn't fit 41 verses in the bulletin. I want to see Pastor Appleton preach 41 verses of the book of Romans. We might have to set aside a week for that. But this is one story. It's a famous story. Last time we saw that Isaac being blessed of God. Uh, and because of that, he was treated unjustly by the government and, he, and with envy by his neighbors because he was blessed. He was blamed for that blessing as if he did something wrong. And he had no legal recourse to assert his rights, but still he did everything possible in the natural to maintain peace with ungodly people so long as he was able to protect and provide provision for his family, for his house, and so long as he was able to worship God rightly. If he had those two things, he was ready to suffer much personally, financial loss and having to give up those wells that cost a lot of time and energy to dig and to have to move his family. That's expensive. But he did it repeatedly because he was trying to serve God and live in peace. And if he could do that, he would spend much to do that. Yet he still justly called out and made a record of the crimes of those who were wronging him because he wanted justice and he didn't seek it in verbal vengeance that just lashed out at them but he wanted them to truly be ashamed of their evils so that they would truly turn from them so that they would do good and benefit themselves and ultimately everyone and we saw that actually did happen by the grace of God the king changed his mind he changed his course he humbled himself he asked Isaac to be reconciled to him to establish a new covenant of peace even disclosing that it was because he saw God was with Isaac well today's text again is one of those most famous stories of the Bible Jacob and Esau, it's a story of two brothers, story of two sons. The first son, the oldest son, does everything his father asks him to in the text. He's respectful, he's diligent, he's hardworking, he's capable. By his own skill that he's developed, no doubt through practice and diligence, he takes a deer, he field dresses it, he prepares a meal from it himself. He knows how to do things. He's respectful, he's diligent, he's hardworking, as I said. He brings this to his father and all the things that his father had asked him to do, he does. And he does it respectfully again. He's responsible. And he does it because his father wants to delight and enjoy these things and he wants to honor his father. And he is obedient and he is hardworking. He speaks nothing but the truth to his father. The other son, he never leaves the house. He doesn't do anything but what he's told to do, like a child or a servant. And many things are done for him. But he schemes, he connives, he impersonates in order to steal what by right of birth belonged to his older brother. And he even plays upon his father's weakness. He takes advantage of his handicap, making him appear to be a fool. And he lies to his father's face over and over again intentionally he pretends to have done the work his father asked him to do when he did nothing his mother did it he even invokes the name of God to better sell his deception and the astonishing thing for us to consider beloved is of the first son God says I have hated and of the second son, God says, I loved. What do we have to learn in this text this morning? Let's pray as we turn to God's word. Father, we thank you for your word. We pray that it would be written on our hearts, that we would be changed. We need the supernatural power of the Spirit. And so send him, the Holy Spirit, to each one we pray. And we pray boldly because you've told us to do this. In Jesus' name. Hear now the word of the Lord, 41 verses, but one story in the text. It is the word of God. Now it came to pass when Isaac was old and his eyes were so dim that he could not see that he called Esau his older son 
And he said to him, My son, and he answered him, Here I am. Then he said, Behold, now I am old, and I do not know the day of my death. Now, therefore, please take your weapons, your quiver, and your bow, and go out to the field and hunt game for me, and make me savory food such as I love, and bring it to me that I may eat, that my soul may bless you before I die. Now Rebekah was listening when Isaac spoke to Esau, his son, and Isaac went to the field to hunt game and to bring it. So Rebekah spoke to Jacob, her son, saying, Indeed, I heard your father speak to Esau, your brother, saying, Bring me game and make savory food for me that I may eat it and bless you in the presence of the Lord before my death. Now, therefore, my son, obey my voice according to what I command you. Go now to the flock and bring me from there two choice kids of the goats, and I will make savory food from them for your father such as he loves. Then you shall take it to your father, and he may eat it, and that he may bless you before his death. And Jacob said to Rebekah, his mother, Look, Esau, my brother, is a hairy man, and I am smooth. Perhaps my father will feel me, and I shall seem to be a deceiver to him. And I shall bring a curse on my head and not a blessing. But his mother said to him, Let your curse be on me, my son. Only obey my voice and go. Get them for me. And he went and he got them and he brought them to his mother. And his mother made savory food such as his father loved. Then Rebekah took the choice clothes of her elder son Esau, which were with her in the house, and she put them on Jacob, her younger son, and she put the skins of the kids of the goats on his hands and on the smooth part of his neck. And then she gave the savory food and the bread which she had prepared into the hand of her son Jacob. So he went to his father, and he said, My father. And he said, Here I am. Who are you, my son? Jacob said to his father, I am Esau, your firstborn. I have just done as you have told me. Please arise, sit, and eat of my game, that your soul may bless me. But Isaac said to his son, How is it that you have found it so quickly, my son? And he said, Because the Lord your God brought it to me. Then Isaac said to Jacob, Please come near, that I may feel you, my son, whether you are really my son Esau or not. So Jacob went near to Isaac, his father, and he felt him and said, The voice is Jacob's voice, but the hands are the hands of Esau. And he did not recognize him because his hands were hairy like his brother Esau's hands. So he blessed him. Then he said, Are you really my son Esau? And he said, I am. He said, bring it near to me, and I will eat of my son's game so that my soul may bless you. So he brought it near to him, and he ate, and he brought him wine, and he drank. Then his father Isaac said to him, come near now and kiss me, my son. And he came near and kissed him, and he smelled the smell of his clothing. And he blessed him and said, surely the smell of my son is like the smell of a field which the Lord has blessed. Therefore may God give you of the dew of the heavens, of the fatness of the earth, and plenty of grain and wine. Let the people serve you and nations bow down to you. Be master over your brethren. Let your mother's sons bow down to you. Cursed be everyone who curses you. And blessed be those who bless you. Now it happened. As soon as Isaac had finished blessing Jacob, and Jacob had scarcely gone out from the presence of Isaac, his father, that Esau, his brother, came in from his hunting. He also had made savory food, and he brought it to his father, and he said to his father, Let my father arise and eat of his son's game, that your soul may bless me. And his father Isaac said to him, Who are you? So he said, I am your son, your firstborn. Esau. Then Isaac trembled exceedingly, and he said, Who? Where is the one who hunted the game and brought it to me? I ate all of it before you came, and I have blessed him, and he indeed shall be blessed. When Esau heard these words, the words of his father, he cried with an exceedingly great and bitter cry, and he said to his father, Bless me, me also, O oh my father. 
But he said, your brother came with deceit and he's taken away your blessing. And Esau said, is he not rightly named Jacob for he has supplanted me these two times. He took away my birthright and now he has taken away my blessing. And he said, have you not reserved a blessing for me? But Isaac answered and said to Esau, Indeed, I have made him your master and all of his brethren. and I have given to him his servants, and with grain and wine I have sustained him. What can I do now for you, my son? And Esau said to his father, Have you only one blessing, my father? Bless me, me also, O oh my father. And Esau lifted up his voice, and he wept. Then Isaac, his father, answered and said to him, Behold, your dwelling shall be away from the fatness of the earth and from the dew of heaven above. By your sword you shall live and you shall serve your brother. And it shall come to pass when you become restless that you shall break his yoke from your neck. So Esau hated Jacob because of the blessing with which his father blessed him. And Esau said in his heart, the days of mourning for my father are at hand. And then I will kill my brother Jacob. The word of the Lord. Nobody can say that scripture is not dramatic and powerful, is it not? When you consider what's going on in this text. I want you to notice the way of works righteousness. First, I want you to notice the way of works righteousness. Look at verses 3 and 4. Isaac tells Esau, his son, to take his weapons, his quiver and bow, to go out in the field to hunt game. Make me savory food such as I love and bring it to me that I might bless you. Some here criticize Isaac in his really crass and carnal affection, you know, that he, he needs to be sated with food before he can be moved, you know, to bless his son in this ceremony. And I mean, there's a possibility of that, but I don't think that's the case. There's a lot of evidence in the Newsy tablets, for example, ancient records, that this was part of a tradition that, that they would do in that day. Just like the covenant. Remember, God covenants with Abraham, and he knows what covenants are because that's what they did in that day. They had these covenants, Abimelech and Abraham, Abimelech and Abraham, Isaac and Abimelech, covenants between men. And so God took a human convention and he uses it in order to communicate salvation. God does that all the time. There was a lot of evidence that circumcision was practiced before God gave it to Abraham. And again, God took a human convention and he filled it with significance. Well, now, this tradition is something that would have been done. And what would have been done, according to these tablets, is that the lesser person, maybe the vassal or maybe the prince or something like that, would bring a, a, an offering of food or a gift or some wine to the king or to the Lord. And by doing that, he would, he would incur, he would lift the soul of the one because they would eat it and they would feel good. And so this was a symbolic thing. And then the, the Lord would bless the servant because he has just like moved him by this good gift. And so this was something that was done in a really practical way that it would, you know, actually take place. And so uh, Isaac is just walking in this so that when Esau brings him this, this hard work, he has to go out and do this and earn it and cook it and, and bring it. And it's going to bless Isaac. He's going to like it. It's going to taste good. And now that he has done something, his son has done something for him, now he's going to give him, you know, this blessing as a show of reward. And we even see something like this in Scripture. For example, in Psalm 103, where we read, Bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that is within me, bless his holy name, right? The contemporary hymn that says that, bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that is within me, bless his holy name. And then it just says, for he has done great things, he has done great things, bless his holy name, and you sing that five times or seven. And it's biblical, but it doesn't do what the psalm is meant to do. Why is the psalmist saying, bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that is within me, bless his holy name, verse 2. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and forget not all of his benefits. And then he names them in the psalm. Who forgives all your iniquities, who heals all your diseases, who redeems your life from destruction, who crowns you with loving kindness and tender mercies, who satisfies your your mouth with good things, and on and on and on. 
In other words, I'm going to bless the Lord from my soul, and it's sincere and real because I'm moved in my soul out of all of the good things God has done for me. And that would be what this ceremony is. That out of the good thing that Esau does for Isaac, it moves him to bless him, right? And so there's nothing wrong with this idea. I don't think Isaac is necessarily, you know, so, like a carnal glutton, as it were. I don't want to uh, besmirch the patriarch more than we have to. But he does show too much carnal affection to Esau because he should not be doing this for Esau. He knows better, all right? And yet there is this, this noble interaction between Isaac and Esau. It says Isaac speaks with Esau in verse 5. And in verse 6, Rebecca describes it as him speaking to Esau. Isaac says please twice to Esau. You just get it once in your English. But he says please to him in verse 3 and in verse 4. There is this mutual respect of a father to his grown son. It's a healthy dialogue. The father is entrusting a task to his son. His son he knows is capable and he's going to go out and do this thing that he was known for. This is a man speaking to a man. All right? Then look at the dialogue between Rebecca and Jacob. And what do you see? Verse 8, now therefore, my son, obey my voice according to what I command you. And again in verse 13, when he protests, let your curse be on me, my son, only obey my voice and just go out and do it. This is a, this is a, child, a, a parent to a child, okay? This is a master to a servant. This is not a mutual relationship of an adult and trusting an adult something. This is somebody who needs to tell somebody else what to do because this other person is just not very capable, right? That's what we're seeing in the text here. We're seeing seven times, at least seven times, Rebecca commands Jacob to do this, to do this, to do this, to do this. Again, it's a, it's a, it's a man who's living at home when he should be out, when he should have his own house and his own family. Esau's out. Esau's married. He's got his own wives. Yeah, that's wrong. But, but he's at least responsible and capable and outside raising his, his family. This, this man is, we would say, a mama's boy. I mean, that's what we would say about Jacob at this point. And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to shock you here. Um, this is going to blow your mind, many of you. There is no doubt, there is no way around the fact, and it lines up precisely in all the commentaries. Notice it, going back to Martin Luther. If you look at when... Uh, uh, Jacob goes to, right after this text, Jacob has to be sent to Laban, and he works seven years for Leah, seven years for Rachel, six years for the, cro for the herds and flocks, and then he flees, right? And when Joseph goes down to Egypt, and it says he's 30 years old when he's let out of the prison, and then there are seven good years and, and two bad years, and then the second bad year, Jacob comes down to Egypt, and he says to Pharaoh, I'm 130 years old, and Joseph at that time is 39 years old, and we can figure it all out mathematically. There's no way it can't be the case. Jacob and Esau are 77 years old in this text. Okay? I know we think of them, the movies, the reproductions, their children, their teenagers. They're 77 years old. Isaac, or sorry, Esau has been married for 37 years. He's got lots of kids. He's got his own house. He's a responsible man. He's a hunter. He provides for them. And, and Jacob's living in mom's basement. <laughs> All right, now I know they live to be 150 at this time. You know, so this is like middle age, you know, 45-year-old man living in the basement. He's not grown up. I mean, there's a sense in which no wonder Isaac wants... Esau to lead the tribe. How can Jacob lead the tribe? How can he possibly lead anything? And what about Jacob's spiritual character? Right? I mean, Isaac's carnal affection is blinded to Esau's profaneness and sexual immorality. But what about Jacob's spiritual character? All right, he does everything that his mom tells him to. And Rather than say, Mom, how can we lie to Dad like this? How can we play this game? What is his one protest? Verse 11, look, Esau, my brother, is a hairy man. I am smooth. What if Father catches me? He's not worried about it being wrong. 
He's not worried about stealing, lying. What if I get caught? Boy, this, this was me before conversion. This, I mean, I, I, want, I want whatever I can get, but I don't want to get in trouble, and I don't want to get caught. There's no way Jacob's converted in this text. A vast majority of commentators would say that happens later. He is thoroughly pagan as his brother. You know, Paul talks about, and such were we, right? We were all children of wrath until God changed our hearts. Now, Rebecca and Isaac are not doing all that great either, and clearly they are converted people, but that just shows that real Christians commit all kinds of sins, right? Rebecca should not be doing any of this. She's doing it because the Word of God says it should be Jacob, and, and Isaac isn't doing right. But that does not give her the right to lie, to steal, uh, to fool him, to do all of these things. She should rather trust in the Lord, right? What happens when Jacob does what he's told? All right, I got to pretend like I'm Esau. I'll just get this over with. It, it doesn't work that way, does it? Because when we commit to tell a lie, it leads to another one and another one. I, uh, Jacob wasn't ready for this. He goes to his father and says, here I am. Who are you? What do you do now? Do you come clean? Dad, I, I'm so sorry. I can't believe I was going to do this. Maybe even leave mom out of it. Protect her name. You know, he doesn't need to know that. I, I, I'm standing here with goat skins on it, and I'm dressed in Esau's clothes, and they're baggy on me. I look like a fool, but I'm here to fool you and steal Esau's birthright, and I'm sorry, I can't do that. I'm not, I, I'm Jacob. I'm leaving my bad. That's not what he does. I'm Esau, your firstborn. I have just done as you told me. No, you did not. First of all, he didn't tell you anything. Second of all, you didn't do anything. Your mom did it all. He didn't cook anything. He didn't kill anything. He brought it to her. She did it all. She made it. All right? And then what? Please arise. Sit and eat of my game. It's not game, it's lambs. It's not wild game, it's lambs, you, li you liar. That your soul may bless me. But Isaac's a little suspicious. The one thing they hadn't thought of was the voice. Do you know how the human mind, the human ear, this is one of the evidences I think of our creation, fearfully and wonderfully, that we are able to distinguish the most finest nuances from voice to voice to voice to voice, right? Right? You could blindfold people and just let them hear the slightest few words and they know who the person is. Even though if you measured that electronically and analyzed it, there might be the finest distinction. But we're, we're wired to recognize voices. Faces is the same way. You can do this study too. Faces, you can see thousands of faces. And if you just look on, on a computer screen, the tiniest little difference, and yet your eye will immediately recognize this face versus this one, this one. Distinguishing these tiny, you don't even think about it. Right? Well, maybe their voices sounded somewhat alike because they were twins. Maybe Jacob's disguising a voice, whatever it is, it's not enough. Isaac's suspicious. Please come near that I may feel you, whether you're really my son Esau or not. And then he feels them, the voice is Jacob's voice, but the hands are the hands of Esau. By the way, okay, so you know these goat skins, you're thinking, well, wait a minute, how does this work? This is not the Western European goats that we see around here, you know, with the little smooth hair and stuff, stuff like that. That's not the kind of goats that they had in the Middle East. These are what's called camel goats or angora goats. You look at them and it looks like the curly hair on a man's chest. And they're kids, so it would have been thinner and sparser. This would feel just like the hair on a man's arm or the hair on a man's chest. A hairy man, and you've, we've all seen like guys, right? The hairy guys, like on the beach, they know that you look up from behind, you think they've got a sweater on or something. It's like, oh, no, that's his back. <laughs> it's funny, because as you get older, that starts to happen more and more. It goes away here, and it comes out everywhere else. But Esau was naturally hair. I, I mean, we've all seen guys, right? You know, hirsute guys, just like hair everywhere. And so he puts these goatskins with this angora, loose, curly hair. It looks and feels just like a man's beard or hair, you know, a hairy arm or something like that. This would have felt like a man. Don't, don't miss that. All right? So he does that. And then one more time, verse 24, are you really? I mean, if there was ever a time he had any compassion for his father or for the truth, 
When his father sort of just, you know, humbles himself before him and, and, and recognizes, look, I'm blind. I don't know for sure. Please, whoever you are, tell me the truth. I'm Isaac, the chosen one of God, the chief of this tribe. You have all sorts of rights and benefits from me. Just show me the respect and tell me the truth. Are you really my son Esau? And Jacob, in Hebrew, Ani. He doesn't hesitate. Some of the commentators pick up on, you know, we're all skilled liars. We're all very good at it. Very subtle. Very, very natural to us to just deceive and to lie. So Isaac's going by his hearing, going by his touch. One more test when he calls him in to kiss him. He smells. He's using everything he can because he knows his family. And he's fooled. And he blesses Jacob with Esau's blessing. Now, I want you to notice one other thing about Esau here. We're going to look at Esau a little bit closer in a moment. But Esau, don't, as much as, I mean, he's a pitiful character. And, and you know, we can't help but have compassion on him in this story. You know, he's, he's clearly wrong. Yet Esau is not a man of faith. And he does not repent. Okay. That's really clear in this text. And Esau is looking to works. He thinks he, oh, you know, he deserves a birthright because he is the firstborn and he does the works and he went out and hunted and did the work and therefore he's looking for payment, okay, from his father. But remember, the blessing is salvation. And that is not the right way to receive it. That's why God chose Jacob and not Esau, all right? Jacob and Rebekah know that what they're doing is in accord with the word of God. That does ameliorate their sin so much. We break the word of God all the time, and we know it's wrong. So we need to keep that in mind, too. But notice what Esau does. After he finds out that Jacob took his blessing, how he pleads with his father, well, bless me, too. Well, bless me, too. Don't you have another blessing? Is that all the blessings that you have? Why? Because he thinks Isaac has the power, by his own works and merit, to bless whomever he wants. Esau is looking to works. And that is not the way the grace of God comes. The gospel of God is by grace. And so secondly, I want you to notice the way of gospel grace. The way of gospel grace. This blessing, that's really interesting, right, is really, uh, and, and maybe you've seen this, I've seen crazy, you know, would-be Bible teachers and leaders, you know, writing about, you know, the generational blessing and how you can do it and all this stuff. Just absolutely absurd, Okay. This is not something that you and I can do. This is a unique thing that's going on in the text. Remember, this is the unfolding of God's plan of salvation, right? God hasn't promised you a land and a whole bunch of children and, you know, all sorts of things that he promised Jacob and Isaac and Abraham as the type of Christ who is both the head of the church and the prophet of the church and the king of God's people. And none of us are that or what are supposed to be that in any way, shape, or form, okay? Even Israel. God divides those offices up. David's house gets the kingship. Aaron's house gets the... Nobody, you know, God is more and more getting us ready for the Christ. But what I want you to notice, that the blessing here is peculiar to the patriarchs. Because they're passing on salvation and they're passing on the covenant of grace. And the person they're passing it on to is the type of Christ to come. So there's a real blessing upon him that's unique. And so for... As much as Isaac is to be faulted for going against the word of God and trying to bless Esau instead of Jacob, when he knows that his wife most certainly would have told him, the, the elder shall serve the younger, yet he's still a man of faith. It's fleshly faith. It's confused faith. But he, he's going he's to pass this blessing on because he believes. He believes in God's salvation. And this is something he should do. And he knows the blessing is by grace. This is why he can't take it back. In verse 33, when Isaac, or Esau pleads. And then again in verse 35, when Esau pleads. Verse 37. I have made him your master. The blessing's been given. It's the grace of God that God authorized me to pass on, listen, as a prophet. This is a prophetic act. You and I can no more do this than we can part the Red Sea with our staff, which Moses was able to do. 
This is something unique. And Isaac knows it. He has, he's done what God's called him to do by the authority of God, and he's passed on the blessing, and he can't take it back. All right? Calvin says it this way, quote, The benediction here spoken of was not a mere prayer, but a legitimate sanction divinely interposed to manifest the grace of election. This is God's choice. He goes on, The Lord enjoined this peculiar service upon the patriarchs, that they should transmit as a deposit to posterity the covenant which he had struck with them. And then Calvin says, this is the same command that goes to the priests, when the priests alone can put up their hands and benedict, bless the people, which is not a prayer but a pronouncement. But even the priests just couldn't go around indiscriminately doing that. He could only do it when they were gathered for worship. He was authorized to pronounce the benediction. And the king couldn't do that. Prophets couldn't do that. God gave that to the sons of Aaron so that... You know, that kind of a thing happens again. The blessing in general on all the people of God, but not the specific things here. This is, this is unique. So Calvin goes on. Therefore, Isaac, in blessing his son, listen, this is crucial, sustained another character than that of a father or a private person. Dads, you're not supposed to sit down your kid someday and you think you can pass on like by magic, you know, some kind of blessing. That's nuts. Okay, that's not Christianity. Calvin says Isaac is not a a father here. He's not a private person. He is the covenant head, unique in history, doing something unique that God has commanded him to do. He was a prophet, Calvin says, an interpreter of God who constituted his son and heir of the same grace. All right. Uh, The original Geneva Bible, Isaac did this as a minister and prophet of God. Not as a father. Not as a dad. Passing on the generational blessings. You know, here's, here's 15 generational blessings and here's the prayer to pay. And, and you can read and buy all that garbage. Don't, don't fall for that. All right? So in the natural, clearly Esau appears to be the better man, the better leader. Maybe this is why Isaac's going against the word of God. Again, original Geneva Bible, the carnal affection he had for his son made him forget what God spoke to his wife. Nobody, no, no serious commentator doubts that Isaac knows the prophecy. Rebecca is not going to hear from God himself who appears and speaks and forget to mention it, all right, about their children. The older shall serve the younger. Calvin says it this way, that Isaac has faith blended, quote, with a foolish, inconsiderate, carnal affection. He blindly contends against the oracle of God. Carnal affection, carnal affection. Matthew Henry tries to find some wiggle room for poor Isaac. Maybe it's possible he didn't rightly understand. Maybe he didn't adequately consider. But in the end of the day, it was still carnal affection that blinded him to it. Matthew Henry agrees. He likes Esau. He likes him better. And that blinds him to doing what God said. And here's a great warning for us, beloved. We have to really be careful of even the good things in our life, even things like children who we are supposed to pour our lives into. That can't blind us to the word of God. Right? That can't cause us to disobey the word of God. Oh, well, I want to do all these things that I think are good for my children, and so we're not going to go to worship today, you know, because I want my kid to, to go play in this soccer league or whatever every Sunday. Um, the word of God says go to worship. And actually, you're not really doing what's good for your child by doing this week after week after week. All right? Are we going to do what the word of God says, or are we going to have some good thing, have a carnal affection for us, and we actually teach our kids wrong? Uh, the Reform study, Reformation Study Bible, the, the study Bible that comes out of Ligonier, says uh, it, it contrasts Isaac's stubbornness with Abraham's humility. Because Abraham obeyed the command of Sarah when Sarah said, cast out the bondwoman and her son, which was what the word of God said. And even though Abraham had a lot of carnal affection for Ishmael, he humbled his heart, he hearkened to the voice of his wife, and he, he did what the word of God said. And maybe Rebecca has tried that. And Isaac said no. And so she feels forced to do this. I mean, we don't know the backstory, um, but she was wrong to do this to Isaac. She should have pled with him, she should have prayed for him, and she should have let God resolve it because God had said, Jacob's going to rule. God's not going to let that fall to the ground. And beloved, this is the thing. If we ever come to a place where we think we have to sin so that God can keep his promises, we're on the wrong road. Well, if I don't lie and deceive and fool my husband and get my son to do this, why, God's word is going to fall to the ground. Yeah. 
God's going to keep his word, but now you're going to bring judgment on your house because you didn't trust him to keep it his way. The same thing that Abraham and Sarah did, remember? Oh, Abraham's going to have a son. Sarah can't have a son. Well, we need to wait on the Lord because we know we can't corrupt marriage like the world says. Oh, no, that's exactly what we're going to do. They didn't trust in God. They didn't wait on the Lord. And they brought judgment to their house. And God still kept his promises. It was not Ishmael. It was Isaac. And that's going to happen again. And by the way, at the end here, Esau does not repent. These are not, we read it in Hebrews. He found no place for repentance in his heart. Why is he weeping? Verse 36, is he not rightly named Jacob? He has supplanted me these two times. He took away my birthright. Now look, he has taken my blessing. That's not true. Jacob didn't take your birthright. You willingly sold it to him. You willingly took an oath to him. You wanted that soup. Don't you remember how good that soup was? You did this, Esau. You see how in his, his anger and in his selfishness and in his pride, he is blaming Jacob for what he did. He did this. And be, as I said to you then, the biggest part of the blessing, the uh, biggest, biggest part of the birthright was the blessing. The birthright is the larger thing. The blessing comes underneath it as the main thing under the birthright. And so when his father said, go and, and take your bow and get this game, hunt it, and I'll bless you, he should have said, Dad, I can't. I sold the birthright to Jacob. You need to call Jacob to get the blessing. That's what he should have done, but he didn't. And then at the end, when he's planning to kill Jacob, is that repentance? I'm going to kill the person who makes me look bad. The very same thing that Cain did. I'm going to kill my brother. This is not repentance. Thirdly, therefore, I want you to notice, repent and believe the gospel. Repent of the believer. Beloved, this scripture is reminding us that salvation is by grace alone. That election is unconditional. There wasn't some good thing in Jacob that caused God to choose Jacob. We're seeing that. And it wasn't like Esau was so much worse. He has a lot of qualities that are better than Jacob at this point in their lives. All right? But as 1 Corinthians 1.26 says, You see your calling, brethren, effectual calling from God that made you a believer. Not many wise according to the flesh. Not many mighty, not many noble are called, but God has chosen the foolish things of the world to put to shame the wise. God has chosen the weak things of the world to put to the shame the things that are mighty. God has chosen the base things of the world, the things that are despised, and the things which were not, to bring to nothing the things that are, that no flesh would glory in his presence. If God would have just given the blessing to Esau after he went out and did these works, there would be a lot more temptation for the people of God to boast that we are of Esau that noble, mighty hunter who did something to get the blessing. But we can't boast because that's not what happened. Beloved, we're not to look at the outward. We're to trust in God who looks at the heart. Remember when, when Samuel was sent to Jesse's house to anoint a king when Saul was going to be replaced? And, and they start bringing Jesse's sons before him. And the first son comes. And it says in 1 Samuel 16, 6, So it was when they came that he looked at Eliab firstborn of Jesse. And he said, this is Samuel, the godly prophet Samuel in his heart. Surely the Lord's anointed is before him. I mean, even Samuel could think when he sees a lie, if there's ever a king, this is him. What does God say? I've rejected him. Because the Lord doesn't look at it like a man. The Lord looks on the heart. Yes, Jacob does not have a good heart in this text, but God's going to give him one. Don't you doubt that. God is going to make Jacob the one whom he says he's the God of more than anyone else, the God of Jacob, more than the God of Abraham, more than the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob, who is faithful, who is godly, but it's only because God gives him a new heart. Don't doubt. I mean, don't deny that this is a sinner, but don't think that, wow, you know, I would do so much better than Jacob. Remember what the woman at the well said? We considered her over this weekend, the woman at the well, when she sees Jesus and Jesus talks to her, and she, the first thing she says, are you greater than our father Jacob who gave us this well? Now, she happened to be talking to, to the one person who was. <laughs> but don't be too quick to think you're greater than Jacob. I don't think I am. I mean, Jacob is the one who wrestled with God and prevailed. 
He gets the vision of the ladder. It's Jacob's ladder. God gives him a new heart. Don't doubt that. But God leaves people to ourselves or to themselves. And, and, but this is an admonition. This text is a warning to us. Matthew Henry says it this way. How could Jacob so readily turn his tongue to say, I am Esau, thy firstborn? How could he say, I've done as you badest me when it was his mother who commanded him? How could he say, eat of my venison when he knew it came not from the field but from the fold? But especially, I wonder, how could he have the audacity to put it upon God and to use his name in the cheat. The Lord thy God brought it to me. Is this Jacob, he asks. Is this indeed Israel without guile? It is certainly written, he concludes, not for our imitation, but for our admonition. And then he says the scripture, let him who thinks he stand take heed, lest he fall. Don't think you wouldn't have done what Jacob did. I think I would have done much worse and for much... I do much worse and for much less reasons. I don't sin to bring about God's word. I sin to break God's word. Every day. Knowing that it's breaking his word. No, I'm not greater than my father, Jacob. But there's also an assurance here, right? I mean, Matthew Henry says God left... Uh, Rebecca to herself to take this indirect course that he might have the glory of bringing good out of evil, of serving his own purposes by the sins and follies of men, that we might have comfort and assurance of knowing that though there is much wickedness and deceit in the world, listen, God governs it according to his will, to his own praise. God is able to bring good out of all of the evil that we see around us. He's able to keep every letter of his word. He did it through even the deceit and the unfaithfulness of J- Jacob and his mother, Rebecca. But on the other hand, don't think that we can do evil now. That good may come, as Paul says. Well, because it's a gospel of grace, shall we do evil that good may come? Let's go out and lie and steal and deceive because it worked out for Jacob. Is that the lesson of this text? That's not the lesson of this text. And in fact, if you looked in history and you studied what happens and you've just followed the scriptures, a lot of hardship comes to the house because of what Jacob and Rebekah do. Immediately, Jacob has to be sent away for 20 years. And do you know, Rebekah never sees her favorite son again. That's what it costs her. All right, you want to lie and pull this off? God loves you. God saves you. But you've brought some judgment on yourself. And and you're going to have to endure this now. That's why we read from Hebrews 12. Not just because Esau didn't repent, but because God chastens those he loves. And he often does so when he leaves us to ourselves. There's an assurance, but there's an admonition in this text. We ought not to sin and think that we're going to bring God's word to pass. God's word is going to come to pass. But if we do this kind of thing with a high hand, we're going to bring pain and suffering on ourselves. And so... Fourthly and lastly, I want you to notice, today is the day of salvation. I think that's the the last part of this text. Today is the day of salvation. Esau's pitiful cries are heartbreaking, but he brought them on himself. He never had a heart for the the birthright. He didn't care about it. In the moment when he just wanted food or he just wanted his hunting or he just wanted his pagan wives, sexually immoral, profane, Hebrews calls him. Didn't worry. You know, the the birthright, that's the future. I don't care about the future. I got plenty of time. Right? He was caught up in the pleasures of the moment. And then it comes, the day of judgment. And he considers the loss of the blessing. He sees it before him, as it were. And it's too awful for him to believe that he's lost it. And he cries out in utter despair. And how can we not see this as a presage, as a foreshadowing of that day when the Lord Jesus Christ is judging the sheep and the goats? And the goats, those on his left, who just had other things to do. Maybe they heard the gospel many times and they thought, oh yes, I'll come and I'll take care of that, but, but right now I'm going to live for the pleasures of the flesh. And, and now they see heaven and eternal life behind Jesus. They see the city 
of gold, the glory and the beauty. And they cry out, bless us, Lord. Don't you want to bless us too? Bless us too. And it's too late. It's too late, beloved. Pleading. Yet on the, in their earthly lives, they didn't have any place for God. Now it's too late. Jeremiah 8, verse 20. The harvest is past. The summer is ended. And we are not saved. How many will say that on that day? Who knew better? Who heard? Who understood? I've got to give my life to Christ. But you know what? Tomorrow. Today is the day of salvation. You may not get tomorrow. Today, if you hear his voice, do not harden your heart. Don't be like the five foolish virgins who thought they could go and get oil later. They wanted to celebrate and party now. They didn't have time to do that. They'll go back. Oh, wait a minute. We'll go back and get it. And then they come back and what? And the door's shut. It's too late. Don't put off. Coming to Christ, living for Christ. There's no better, most, more glorious, more wonderful thing to do. And the Bible shows itself to be true. It's true. I mean, we feel it in our hearts. God's going to judge. We know that. Every, every, every person knows that. But the Bible shows itself to be true. And the Bible alone tells us the way of salvation. We don't learn that from the creation. And it says that it's by Christ. But I want you to notice this blessing that God gives to Esau. This is a prophetic blessing. Just as Isaac's is a prophetic blessing, it's going to come to pass in the future. When Jacob blesses his sons, he's talking about the future for each one, especially Judah, who, to, to whom is going to be given the scepter and so forth. It's prophecy. But this comes to pass. Behold, and this is why I read it this way, your dwelling shall be away from its men, the prefix in Hebrew, which means away from. The Greek Septuagint translates it a paw, away from. For some reason, the King James puts it in of here. That's not right. ESV, New American Standard, both put from. From the fatness of the earth, from the dew of heaven above. Esau's going to live in a barren wasteland. And guess, Edom is the, is the country of Esau. Guess what Edom is? A barren wasteland. This is hundreds of years before he gets this land. It's a barren wasteland. In fact, Seetzen has said it's the most desolate and barren mountains probably in the world. The mountains of Edom. And this, your brother, you're going to serve your brother, but when you become restless, you'll break his yoke from your neck. This happens. Back and forth, back and forth. Edom is defeated by Saul. David completely subjugates it and makes them servants. But then they rise up and rebel against Solomon. Solomon puts it down, but then Edom rebels against Joram decades later. And they this time succeed, and they, they break Jacob's yoke. They make their own king. And then what happens? They're subdued again by Amaziah decades later. Then they break free under Ahaz near the end of the kingdom of Judah, and, and they have their own kingdom until Babylon conquers them and Israel. But then in 129 BC, John Hyrcanus of the Maccabeans, when Judah has independence, conquers Edom again and forces them to be circumcised. And then Herod the Great rises up. Remember what Herod the Great was? An Idumean, an Edomite, a descendant of Esau, and he causes the kingdom to be independent again until Rome destroys Jerusalem in 70 AD. Why did I say that? Because only the Bible can predict the future. Hundreds of years, thousands of years, this happens. Esau is restless. Jacob rules. Esau breaks his yoke over and over again. Are you going to doubt the Bible when it's true? And the Bible says that only the Lord Jesus Christ can save you from your sins. Believe in him and you'll be saved. If we believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, we go before the throne of the Father, not with lamb skins roped onto our wrists, and our big brother's robe that doesn't fit. We go clothed in the righteousness of the one who, whose birthright it is. And we stand before the Father, and he doesn't see us. He sees his firstborn son, not by deception, not by infirmity, but because it was his plan. Because he so loved the world that he said, I'm going to send my firstborn to die so that whoever believes in him will wear his robes in my presence and I will give him the blessing of my firstborn son. That's your promise if you believe in Jesus, but you have to do it before you die. Let's pray as we turn to God's word. Father, again, we thank you for your word. We thank you, Lord God, as we've completed again a story from your text that is true. Father, how we pray that you would cause us to believe, that you would cause us to repent. 
that you would cause us, Lord God, to learn from, from Esau's lesson, that he found no place for repentance. We can weep and cry over our sins, but if we don't turn to Jesus, it's not going to matter. So I pray if there's any here who have been struggling, who have been thinking that their answer is in the world, Lord God, let them see how foolish that is. Let them see that there is nothing in the world but dust and that the true salvation and joy and blessedness forever and ever comes to everyone who believes in Jesus. And so, Father, give them that grace. Regenerate them, effectually call them, unite them to Christ and cause them to believe, to repent and to throw off those shackles and live for you and let them see immediately how much more joyful it is. And I pray this all in Jesus' name.